Good morning. Um, I'm going to go in for a slight distraction. My talk, it says here, is uh, supposed to be on the demand side, demand response, energy efficiency. Incidentally, I define energy efficiency as anything you do which ends up over its life cycle of your investment as saving you money, uh, as opposed to most of the things we talked about yesterday, which are absolutely necessary, but uh, they're going to cost, they're innovations which are going to cost you a little more than the present uh, pretty cheap electricity and gasoline and other fuels that we now have. But uh, since there are uh, lots of old friends in the audience, and uh, since I quit the Energy Commission in January, uh, some of my friends want to know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, I am dabbling a little bit at the uh, instigation of my colleague in physics, Rich Muller, in uh, looking at something to do with climate, namely uh, surveying the world's uh, land surface, surface temperatures. And um, that's sort of interesting enough that I wanted to have Rich show his face. Rich, would you come up here? And uh, I'm going to show the first slide. And uh, Rich is going to say good morning. And uh, oh, you want this. Um, many of you know Art Rosenfeld from his great work in, in, in energy efficiency, particularly in conservation. But I knew Art when he was one of the leading figures in the world in elementary particle physics. He wrote the, a textbook on nuclear physics. And one of the little things he did during that period was to create what we used to call the Rosenfeld Tables, which is a compendium of all of the world's data on, uh, on the, the results and with an analysis of elementary particle physics. So when we started creating a team, I was really happy to get Art to be a member of this team. The team members are right here. We have a top statistician. We have climate scientists, Judith Curry, uh, a bunch of people, um, Saul Perlmutter. Um, Robert Rohde is, 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 is doing most of the work. What are we trying to do? We, are, we believe that the most important data analysis in the coming year on the issue of climate change is to look at the surface temperatures. Th these are the things, you've seen these, the plots of surface temperature in many, many of the talks. Um, there are three groups around the world that estimate surface temperature from the records, from the 1.6 billion measurements that have been made mostly over the past 150 years. Uh, these groups don't completely agree with each other. Uh, Jim Hansen at NASA has the fact that uh, it, it's now the warmest year ever. The two other groups, one in the UK, one at NOAA, have the warmest year ever in 1998. There are differences that are small, a tenth of a degree or so, but in terms of knowing what's happening in the future, if the global warming is a little bit worse than we think, we have less time and we have to panic. If it's a little bit less than we think, then we can take some long-term solutions. So we need to know this number precisely. And the data are not available. They're available, but nobody can read them. We have bitten the bullet, mostly Rhodey's work, of getting the 10 different data sets and merging them into one data set that we hope to release within the next few months that everybody can then analyze the world's temperature data. And this is, this is where the skills of art uh, are really valuable, to put this out in a form where it can be usable by other scientists. We are then, we have our top statisticians, we're, we are going to make this utterly transparent. We're going to do our own analysis, so we will be a group that will be reporting on how much global warming there has been. We will do this with statistical methods that are completely transparent. These are the, the sites around the world in which we have good data. Uh, if we look at what other people have done, this is the data as a function of time. This is how much data they actually used in their analysis. You notice the big drop off here. This is not a conspiracy. <laughs> it, is, it is simply uh, the fact that they use only the monthly data, and then the amount of monthly data has dropped off recently because people stopped compending the, the, the monthly data. The data that are available are shown in red and in blue, and that's what we will be using. We're going to attempt to use every bit of data. David Brillinger believes we can do this, use almost all of the data. There are all sorts of potential biases when you're using such a subset of the data, and these have never been addressed. Is there a data selection bias? 
We will be taking a fresh look at the urban heat island effect. We'll be taking a fresh look at the way they correct for temperatures and the way they extrapolate temperatures. And we're going to be doing this in a totally transparent way. So uh, here is, can't quite see this. Here's our website. It's, it's berkeleyearth.org. And uh, we're getting some funding from the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, some, some, from, some, from some private foundations, the Folger Foundation, and so on. And, and so uh, we're hoping to come out with not only a new estimate of global warming, which we hope will be uh, with fully established errors, we think, a, a, a new result, but in addition to make the data in a format, a Murray's format, so if you want to get in this business, it will be relatively easy. There won't be this huge barrier of how do I read this format. Uh, but the merge data set will allow you to do that, and it'll be completely transparent. So, so I'm delighted to have Art helping us with this, and, and uh, expect to hear from us within a few months. He gave you the laser pointer. Oh. <laughs> I have a collection of those. OK, thank you, Rich. Um, I want to put uh, energy efficiency in context. Um, Paul just mentioned that there are lots of savings, uh, trillions of dollars worth, if we can get our act together and exploit it. And I wanted to uh, show you a curve to show what a big business um, energy is, and therefore why improving it a few percent a year makes a lot of difference. This is a plot not of energy efficiency, but the economists tend to prefer energy intensity, which is just the inverse of efficiency in a very general way. It's defined as the amount of energy you need to increase gross domestic product by, say, $1,000. And uh, it inexorably comes down with time as we get smarter. Um, this is a scale of dollars per, oh, I'm sorry, of, excuse me. Uh, this is a scale of, oh dear. I think I'm inadvertently right-clicking. There we go. Keep my, left, my finger on my left click. Thanks, Rich. Um, uh, this is a plot of millions of BTU needed to get $1,000 worth of uh, GDP improvement, marginally. And what you can see is that in this series, it heads down in the times between 1949 and the embargo in the fall of 1973. But it comes down rather slowly. As we learn better things and get better materials, we handle, uh, in those days, oil and gas better. Uh, but the dr drop was about uh, half a percent a year, 0.4 percent a year, and ends up, if we hadn't done anything, at a scale here, which I'm going to talk about in a second, what actually happened is the blue line, uh, you can, there's some liberty as to how you eyeball a red, the red line through the blue line, but anyway, uh, with a modest slope. And then this is when all of a sudden there was a shortage of gasoline, uh, a shortage of electricity because um, a lot of, a lot of American power was on oil in those days. And uh, down it came, this is the, the Golden days of energy efficiency, when the power came, when the uh, use of electricity first became of interest, and uh, automobiles mileage became of interest. We went from 14 miles per gallon in 1975 to 24 miles per gallon in 1985. Uh, then OPEC collapsed, I think, uh, to a great extent because uh, its market collapsed. Uh, as the world, as the Western world went in for efficiency, 
This is what I call the Reagan-Thatcher years in which we said, oh, we've solved that problem now. OPEC's collapsed. Uh, and then this region here is pretty interesting. Uh, there's a paper by Joe Rome and me, and there are many others who think that uh, a lot of this is productivity increase uh, brought on by the use of computers and personal computers and better communications and so on. Um, keep my fingers off the mouse entirely. Um, if we had done nothing, our energy bill, well, not last year. There, there's been a certain amount of uh, complications and instabilities because of the Depression. This is to 2007. Um, our energy bill last year would have been $2.1 trillion, uh, which is 15% of gross domestic product. As a matter of fact, we kept our act together in a rather nice way. This is not California, this is the United States. Uh, the actual energy bill last year shrunk to $1.2 trillion. Uh, the savings, folks, is about a $1 trillion a year, and that's a lot of money. And improving this rate here from 2% uh, two a, two a year, which is average since the embargo to down here, uh, by maybe even one more percent per year, as you see if your patient uh, makes a great deal of difference. Just to give you some idea of how large this savings is. And incidentally, I assert that nobody felt during this time that we were freezing in the dark. Uh, it was a pretty easy transition. Um, just to show you how big this is, uh, I looked up the deficit for the year 2007. And it was $1 trillion. It's been, we've gotten used to larger numbers recently, but let's hope that that's transient. Um, meaning if we'd kept the same energy services and kept taxes the same, uh, the deficit would have been twice as big if we hadn't uh, used our brains and adapted. Now, this is not all straight efficiency. Some of it is offshoring. It's a generalized response to higher prices. Um, what we really learned in 1973 is that energy was dirt cheap in the United States, and what's dirt cheap tends to get treated like dirt. And uh, now we're treating it with uh, more respect. Um, to give you some other discontented view of how much uh, one nearly a trillion dollars is per year, that's, that's more than enough every year to pay for the Department of Defense, including fighting one and a half wars. So. Uh, We've made some difference, and we ought to pay attention to this. And uh, you can have many reactions. You could say, well, we're doing fine as it is, but I think we ought to pay attention to this. So that's my uh, introduction. Now, Ca California has done somewhat better. Uh, and so I'm going to switch to the plot that uh, Paul Wright referred to. Um, the scale is, the X scale is from 1960 to the big bar here at the embargo. And then, as you can see, uh, things separated. The scale has been changed also in two ways. Instead of being per dollar gross domestic product, it's per person. Because uh, as we see from the behavior of the stock market in the last couple of years, uh, per person, the number of people is a lot more stable than their incomes. Uh, also, um, the E over GDP plot that I showed first included gasoline. Uh, California uh, is preempted on gasoline, or at least was until the recent Supreme Court decision. And so um, uh, that way smooths things out. So this is electricity only where we control our own destiny. Uh, and it's uh, a market about the size of gasoline anyway. Uh, the golden curve for the golden state is uh, California. And uh, as Paul said, it stayed more or less flat for 30 years now. Uh, that's despite a huge trend in electrification. So to get it to stay flat meant making a huge improvement in the existing uh, loads for, on electricity. Uh, refrigerators, air conditioners, heaters, housing, so forth and so on. The purple curve 
is the United States, which had access to the same information, didn't respond quite as fast, went up an extra 2% a year, has grown an extra 2% a year, and uh, leveled off recently, um, but by now has gone up 50% since uh, where it started in 1973. So, uh, uh, so we Californians do have something to be proud of. Now, we also have to make some disclaimers. Um, of this savings, only about a third is standard improvements in efficiency, which I can show you in the next slide. Uh, about a third is that our electricity is more expensive. We don't have coal. We've always had an environmental approach to electricity. And uh, thirdly, poo. Uh, and thirdly, uh, there's what I call the Camelot effect. That is the weather, uh, at least for the first 20 years when almost everybody lived along the coast, was sublime. It didn't take much organization to build new buildings which take very little energy. Uh, that can't be said of Chicago, Ohio, or even Washington, D.C. So uh, about a third of this effect is, is straight efficiency, and uh, that's all I want to claim. Uh, where did the straight efficiency part come from? Um, this, uh, I'm afraid, is not up to date, uh, historic but not up to date, is a plot of the savings from three main plans uh, in California uh, from 1976, where we started the clock, to 2003. Uh, the efficiency savings from utility programs have gone up uh, drastically since 2003 because the budget, uh, as interest has come, up, uh, come along again in global warming, the budget for utility efficiency programs has tripled and is now $1 billion a year. Uh, at this time, it was only about 1% of electric bills. It's now 3% of electric bills and uh, has paid off. So the, um, about half of the improvements have come from the most efficient trick known to man, which is building standards and appliance standards. And I'll show you some examples of that. Um, appliance standards uh, tend to get started in California and then get adopted by the federal government. Uh, building standards are state only because um, building types, weather, and so forth and so on are really uh, different for each state. In California, they're different with, for 16 different climate regions within California. And the utility programs um, are, were voluntary, uh, but a good way to do business until uh, about 1995, uh, then we tried decoupling or restructuring of the utilities that didn't work very well and gave us energy shortages and a recalled governor uh, in 2005. And now we're pretty much back onto uh, efficiency programs run by the utilities, but paid for by you, the ratepayers, uh, under the management of the PUC. And that seems to have be stable now and working out very well. And Diane Grunick will take th that part of the thing on this afternoon after lunch. Um, this is to give you some idea of how big the changes have been. Uh, indexed to 100, uh, refrigerators, and I'll show you another plot in a moment, have come down to one quarter of their energy use for bigger refrigerators. Uh, air conditioning, the hardware has come down to about one third of its use, and uh, the country has been broken up into three climate zones, which makes the hardware more adaptable. Um, what you might notice is that the open arrows are California standards before the federal government got in the game. The federal government got in the game of appliance standards uh, very successfully, but rather late. It uh, required that Mr. Reagan leave office before they got adopted. And then the feds took over uh, this, these standards uh, later on and are now, as I said, doing well. Uh, 
Um, this is my favorite plot. Everybody's probably seen it 13 times. I won't belabor it. Uh, but very fast for the newcomers. This is the size of refrigerators are creeping up from eight cubic feet in 1947 uh, with a little hindrance because you can't get anything bigger through the kitchen door, <laughs> uh, leveling off at about 20 cubic feet. Uh, the rise here of 9% a year in demand of the refrigerators is because everybody was trying to sell more inside volume for the same size kitchen door, which meant much thinner insulation and a little crimping on copper and materials. Uh, this right-hand turn here is uh, one of the more dramatic examples of uh, the power of labels and the threat of standards. The standards actually came in about here. And now we're down to a quarter, and we're going to go. This, is, this corresponds, incidentally, to about a 40-watt uh, light bulb burning all the time now. This corresponded to a 200-watt light bulb burning all the time. Um, the, the, what, what everybody may not have seen is the green line, which is the retail price. Now, the retail price is supposed to go up a little bit as you invest in better insulation and better heat exchangers. But what happens is the manufacturers all put in new production lines. And they use all the clever tricks from the last 30 years. And the stuff turns out to be cheaper. And, pro and certainly did not go through the roof. So um, I, I think that's, th that's good uh, backup for the people who say there are lots of jobs out there selling green refrigerators and green air conditioners. And I'll give you another example of that uh, next, I think. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Um, this is air conditioning and shows the battle between large houses and better air conditioners. Uh, indexed or all starting together uh, in 1980. The blue line represents how much house, house, the average house square footage has grown uh, between 1980 and 2005. The, the flat line is uh, an extrapolation at the top on the blue line uh, and should be dashed. But it's uh, uh, whoever did it thinks that housing sizes have saturated. And uh, I think so, too. The purple line below it is the gain you get because air conditioners have gotten more efficient. But then along comes the building standards, Title 24, which requires adequate roof insulation and starting in 2008 required that in the hottest climate zones of the state, the roofs be white or cool colored. Um, and then you see we're down from uh, 3,700 or something to 1,200 and something, so down to a third for the cost of air conditioning per square foot in California. Um, savings are hundreds of dollars per year. This is uh, one of my favorite slides to show in China, which is a comparison of the Three Gorges Dam to refrigerator improvements. Uh, now, uh, I happen to think the Three Gorges Dam was a good idea. But uh, starting in 2000, the Chinese uh, adopted refrigerator standards and sold them uh, according to those standards for five years, and then in 2005, uh, souped up the standards, and there's another five years of sales there. So that ends in 2010. Uh, meanwhile, about the year 2000, the Three Gorges Dam started getting filled and was fully filled by about uh, a couple of years ago. The output of the Three Gorges Dam, electricity, terawatt hours per year, uh, is a convenient number of 100. But the better standards alone, uh, uh, add up to about 80. In other words, uh, China has profited. China's economy has profited by 180 billion kilowatt hours a year from these two measures. The difference is, of course, that the Three Gorges Dam was the most expensive, uh, both monetarily and politically, uh, engineering version in the world. 
whereas nobody even noticed the refrigerator standards. Uh, nobody complained, everybody's saving money. Um, in terms of money, uh, I like to make the extra point that the Three Gorges Dam is producing electricity which is used as far off as Beijing, which means transmission towers, expenses to send it up there, manage it, control it, distribute it, and so on, which about, uh, which, uh, about doubles. Well, no, this is, three, this is Three Gorges Dam at wholesale price. But the comp competition is refrigerators and air conditioners sold in Beijing, where the, uh, where the Three Gorges electricity eventually ends up. Um, that takes about a factor two of transmission and all the things I just mentioned, management, distribution. So in terms of dollars for the Chinese economy, uh, clearly air conditioners and refrigerators are way ahead of Three Gorges. Uh, I think that's good news. Um, uh, recently, meaning about three years ago, um, California put the first limits under appliance standards on what I call vampires. These are the little black power supplies that run my computer, for example, uh, or at my home, my cell phone, my garage door opener, my fax machine, my unplugged power tools. Uh, and they had added up to something like 10% of power in California. Uh, we surveyed the world and discovered that uh, it was time to switch to from old-fashioned ballast, which had transformers and ran at 60 cycles per second, to new ballasts, uh, which were electronic power supplies and ran at high frequency. The price didn't go up at all. The energy use went down on the average from three watts and warm to the touch and plugged in all the time, when plugged in all the time, to uh, less than one watt required and uh, typically less than a tenth of a watt, actually, once they switched to electronic supplies. That eliminated about 5% uh, of residential load, uh, and the cost was zero. Uh, and by working on significant loads like that, we've allowed uh, all sorts of new gadgets to have place in the house and the commercial buildings and uh, not raise our energy use per person. Now, I'm going to change subjects, and uh, I'm going to talk about cool roofs. And uh, I'm going to introduce this with a caveat. Um, cool roofs, it turns out, are the cheapest single way to delay global warming. I'm going to ras get fairly enthusiastic about this over the next 10 minutes. But I don't want to overdo it. Uh, in some sense, this is the smartest idea I've heard of in the last year or so. And we should do it. Uh, and I spend a lot of my time telling that to people. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of uh, solving the global warming problem, uh, it's a little discouraging that uh, if you actually figure out what, how many Sokolo wedges this will do for us, and we need seven to delay global warming for 50 years, um, it's maybe half of a wedge. So one-fifth of the problem, so a 5% first step. And I don't want to oversell my own enthusiasm. Well, um, uh, no more, the modern age don't have handouts. This talk is available on my website. And uh, I guess it'll be available. I can't see anybody out there with the lights. But Paul, I guess it will be available. Uh, it will from this proceeding. OK. So let me say, as long as mankind has had buildings, and most mankind uh, evolved where it was hot, and most Big cities are still where the summers are hot. And it's generally recognized that if you want to cool your building and be more comfortable, uh, in the old days, you had a white roof and maybe a whole white building, ask the Greeks or the Spaniards. Or Casablanca actually means uh, white house. Um, so that, that's a well-known trick. Um, in fact, in Israel, it's actually required because they're on oil and they don't like to 
the drain on their economy of air conditioning, they discourage air conditioning and require that during the, after the rains quit in the summer, that uh, you have to whitewash your roof. Roofs are flat. There's not a lot of snow load in it, Israel. Um, as long as we've had large cities, uh, people have known that downtown is hotter than suburbs. And that's called the summer urban heat island. And uh, cool roofs cool the city. So that's pretty well established. Um, since we've had a global warming problem, uh, a number of people have uh, tried to calculate if we made all the roofs white, would it make a significant uh, change in the climate or in the weather or in the climate? And the, if you make that calculation uh, early in the game when cities were only 1% of, or half a percent of urban, when urban areas were only about half a percent of the world's land, um, you ended up with a cooling of a tenth of a degree in, for the world. And uh, that didn't sound very good, easy to sell. Um, what, what's new is that uh, uh, recently, uh, Hashem Akbari, who is the, was the head of the Heat Island Research Group up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I, uh, and a climatologist, published a paper uh, I'll get, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's on the website. I uh, published a paper saying, look, instead of uh, talking about temperature, let, let's first make the remark that a tenth of a degree isn't uh, nothing. We're going to break our backs and spend a trillion dollars uh, trying to uh, delay global warming by two degrees, so a tenth of a degree is actually 5% of the solution. So uh, that's still not a good sales argument. What we did was to say, look, um, glaciers and white surfaces and Arctic sea ice and so on cool the world. We're losing some of that now. We can replace some of that with white roofs in cities. And the cooling effect of the white roof offsets the heating effect of a certain number of tons of CO2. And uh, if you calculate that certain number of tons, it turns out to be in the billions of tons. And uh, the difference is that we have a price for CO2. We're interested in energy, but we don't have any price for energy. We do have a price for CO2. And it turns out to be half a trillion dollars uh, of savings if you try these tricks. So now I'm going to launch into just something about why he, you, you sell heat islands. I'm sorry, you sell white roofs mainly on the basis of comfort and saving air conditioning. But uh, the byproduct of cooling the earth is, uh, gives it a higher priority now. And luckily, uh, the Department of Energy uh, is now requiring that all its roofs go white. Uh, since 2005 in California, uh, Title 24 building standards have required that if a roof is flat, so there are no architectural issues, uh, then it shall be white. And nobody's bothered to complain in a serious way. So Sac California is rapidly going white. And uh, the problem is to spread this enthusiasm around the world. So there's a typical summer heat island. Um, out here is the suburbs or the forest, which has nice evapotranspiration, which helps you stay cool, too. You get into suburbs with less trees, and you get the real summer heat island. You get really downtown, and there the density of cars, air conditioners, and so on makes it sort of hopeless. But of course, this temperature uh, starts off from this temperature, which has been cooled by white roofs. And so there's your typical situation. Um, there's uh, another reason for keeping cities cool. I remind you that there was a European heat wave in 2003, uh, which resulted in 30,000 deaths. There was a recent heat wave, not as serious, in 2010, and there was no discussion of deaths. We've more or less learned how to handle that problem. But these are 100-year events which are beginning to occur more frequently than every 100 years. And so there is a human health issue here. 
Um, this is uh, a picture. It happens to be Philadelphia, which is going in for a white roof campaign. But I lived for 10 years in Chicago under just such, under a sea of black roofs like this, which are slightly cheaper in first cost. Uh, um, asphalt is a good water repellent. But uh, life cycle costs, the, these uh, asphalt roofs only last five or 10 years, and then they break up. A lot of the breakup is because they run so hot that they expand and contract every day, uh, and don't necessarily expand or contract at the same rate that the structure underneath them does, so they crack. Um, a typical black roof like this uh, will run about 90 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the ambient air. This uh, white roof uh, runs about 10 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient air. So you can see the, ex the exp expansion contraction problem is much less. Um, these white roofs are good for about 20 years. Um, in Chicago, there were 700 deaths in 1995, heat wave. And uh, that was a small enough number of deaths that the Department of Public Health visited every location to find out what was wrong. And what they found was that virtually all of the deaths occurred on the top floors of buildings in the third day of a heat wave, and these buildings had white roofs, had black roofs. So again, uh, public health issues. I'm going to go for a, a, a brief tour of what's going on. This is just a few minutes fun with Google Earth. And you can have lots of fun with Google Earth yourself. You can look and see what your house looks like or your office building looks like. And uh, uh, I've been doing that. Uh, the moral to the story is where people think it's hot, uh, they go in for white roofs already in the United States. Uh, the problem with California is we don't think of it as being really hot. And so it took a little uh, standards to do the trick. Uh, that's Santorini, Greece. Uh, there, it seems to pay to do the whole building, uh, at least certainly the ones on this hillside. Uh, this is in Hyderabad, India. Uh, people like to sleep outside, uh, but the concrete, th these roofs are concrete, but the concrete gets very hot during the day. And so if you can keep it cool, you have a cooler roof to sleep on at night, and your apartment is more comfortable. In fact, in India, I'm told it's, uh, there are a lot of Indians here. I hope nobody will challenge this. I, I'm told that it's well known that the top floor buildings, which typically have black roofs, uh, are less comfortable than lower floors and, in fact, command less rent. And so there doesn't seem to be any objection to suddenly thinking about making them white. Um, this is a Walmart store in Northern California. Um, the neighboring store here uh, shall remain anonymous, but they have since painted their roof white as uh, they needed repair and the new standards require it to be white. Uh, the savings uh, from a white roof compared with a dark roof are typically 20% in air conditioning load. Uh, Walmart decided as early as 2003, I think, that white roofs were the way to go. Uh, they have 4,000 done so far. They have 2,000 to go. But uh, it's a standard company policy. And uh, anyway, in California, they have to do it. Uh, this is a UC Davis campus. I won't show you the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, it, uh, it's quite different, but on the other hand, it's a lot cooler in Berkeley, so you'd expect it to take a little longer to take over. And we don't have that many new buildings, and we have a lot of tile roofs, which will outlast all of us. So um, That's the University of Tucson in Arizona, about three quarters white roofs and uh, a quarter uh, traditional tile, which, as I said, is uh, going to stay there till, till global warming takes over. Uh, a lot of roofs, you notice, are uh, white uh, on the residential area around the university. That's Washington, D.C., a whole pile of government buildings with green roofs. Uh, 
that's the Supreme Court, and that's the Folger Library of Congress, rather, uh, and they're okay. Uh, what, I had a lot of fun with this one because uh, over here on the mall, uh, this is the Forrestal DOE headquarters with a sort of dirty, dirty whitish roof, which is going to go white this fall and uh, is uh, out, outshone greatly by the, uh, the, this, by this building, which is uh, transportation. But in general, uh, Washington is taking a while to catch on. Uh, the last picture was the funnest one. Uh, that's the Pentagon, which really doesn't get it. I, th I thought they might get some credit for these white roofs here, but that turns out to be the Metro System Station. <laughs> so uh, the Marine Corps has announced it is going in for white roofs. And uh, uh, I had a wonderful chance to give this lecture to a, a room full of generals, admirals, and com commandants. And uh, I, I think they're scratching their head now and trying to figure out what to do about the Pentagon. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, anything complicated about this diagram. It's just really reminding me to uh, take you back to yesterday when we discussed global warming. Uh, the, the buzzwords I only want to say is energy comes through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is trans transparent to sunlight. And the trick to do is to not, degrade, not absorb that sunlight, but put it back into outer space where it belongs, and then it doesn't heat the Earth. If you do absorb it on a dark surface, it degrades into heat, which is trapped by the greenhouse effect. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So uh, this is from the global, this is leading into global warming. Uh, we made this calculation. This is from a paper by Akbari, Menon, and Rosenfeld. Uh, which were published in January of 2009, and uh, has a new number in it, which says that uh, if you put enough of these roofs together, you cool the world. But if you ask on a single roof how many tons of carbon dioxide heating, ah, Uh, how many tons of uh, carbon dioxide heating do you avoid? The answer turns out to be per 1,000 square feet, which is, this is, flat roofs are mainly on commercial buildings. This is not a house, but it's, it's the size of a modest American house without a garage, just a convenient unit, that you offset the heating effect, you offset the emissions of about 10 tons of CO2. Now, uh, a typical American car, a typical American house emits about 10 tons of CO2 per year. So you offset your house for a year. Um, if you uh, want to think in terms of cars off the road, a typical American car uh, emits four or five tons a year. So you, emit, you avoid the emissions of your family car for two years for free. Why not do it? Um, if you observe that 1,000 square feet of roof is about what the world has today in the form of flat roofs for commercial buildings, schools, clinics, and so forth and so on, then you've got to multiply, and you want to sell this in urban areas where you're cooling the heat island anyway, then the answer is you've got to multiply that number by about 3 billion. And uh, then you save 25 billion tons of CO2. You don't save it. The, the damn CO2 is, of course, still up there acidifying the ocean. You offset its heating effect. But it's a nice reprieve. It would offset, this alone would offset global warming for about 11 years. Um, if implemented over 20 years, uh, which is the life of the roof, and then you got to back, go back and uh, re-roof, because the roof wore out, started leaking, um, you can uh, change that into a rate which is 1.2 billion tons per year. And that's the same as taking away the emissions of 300 million cars for that 20-year program, so for 20 years off the road. Uh, that's half the cars in the world. It seems worth doing. 
This is just to remind me that uh, this paper has now been corroborated by several serious general circulation model runs, and all, everything seems to agree with it about a factor of two. Um, California, as I said, has already required this where there's no architectural issue. There's a whole science of cool colored roofs, which will go over much easier for sloped roofs. Um, and uh, that list will be expanded at the next time. The important thing to do here is to note that the model code agencies, uh, with technical words like ASHRAE and IEC, uh, are going to, on, and their next editions are going to assume white roofs on the top of buildings. Uh, and then you can do anything you want, but you should realize that you're having to invest in expensive air conditioners with monthly bills if you don't. Um, I think I'll skip that one. Um, recent cool progress, uh, Philadelphia has done a de demonstration project. Um, uh, in 2011, we're going to launch a voluntary program for the largest 100 coolest cities in the world, which takes you down to a population of about 3 million per city people. Uh, and most of them are in warm climates. So uh, we're going to try to get a uh, voluntary campaign going. Meanwhile, the United States is going to offer uh, technical assistance to countries who will uh, address the cool roof problem and convince themselves that this is a good way to go. Uh, and now I see that I'm going to have to ask Paul. I have about seven slides on smart grid and demand response, but I've also used up 43 minutes out of my 40 minutes. Uh, do you want me to quit, or do you want me to go ahead? I can't see you through all these lights, so I'm just sort of peering, assuming that somebody's in charge. Please, please continue for another five minutes. And Try and. Uh I, I'll Continue for another five minutes and try and... Uh, okay, uh, well, thanks, and, and there'll be a chance for questions later on, too. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, since I'm talking about uh, the demand side, uh, I did want to say a few words about what I call the non-gee whiz uh, side of uh, smart grid and demand response. Um, we will hear talks about, well, I don't know. We, we'll, we'll hear some talks about uh, the smart grid and all the things one can do to protect one's property, which is transmission lines, uh, generators, and other expensive equipment, transformers. Uh, that's what I call the G whiz size. It involves switching large amounts of current in milliseconds uh, and lots of high tech equipment. Um, the other place where high tech comes in is you hear lots of discussions of uh, buying a, of a large number of plug-in electric hybrids or electric cars and uh, using them to control load. Um, there's one problem with that one right now, and that is that uh, there aren't any plug-in hybrids or uh, electric cars. And I guess the first picture I want to show you is leading up to demand response. This is a picture of California during the year 2006. The individual teeth here are weeks with uh, less demand on weekends. Uh, and you can see that during January through May, uh, we're about a 40 gigawatt system, 40,000 megawatts, but I'm calling them gigawatts. Uh, then there's a hot summer in which the load goes up 50%, uh, about half of that being residential and half of it being commercial air conditioning. And then we come down again to, th to 40 gigawatts. That means that there's a 50% increase in California's electric capacity needed during the summer. Uh, most of that is for air conditioning. 
Um, I kind of wish that people would put more attention onto the 20 gigawatts of available load management uh, as compared with the no gigawatts which are available so far from electric cars. Uh, obviously, the electric car is a big challenge. It's very interesting, and it has a future. But you're going to have to sell an awful lot of millions of electric cars to get up to this. Now, the problem with electricity in California right now, and one reason that this is a 50% increase, is that uh, we used to read the meter once a month. The congestion is every afternoon. Uh, there's a hell of a poor feedback mechanism. So um, starting way back in the year 2000, when I first joined the Energy Commission, it was fairly clear we were going to crash. This was under re restructuring. And uh, I made some quick phone calls to some friends in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Department of Power and Light and uh, to Sacramento Municipal Utility District and said, look, let's, let's try raising the thermostat uh, at peak times, which is 3 to 5 PM or 3 to 7 PM, by 4 degrees from 70 to 74, and see if anybody complains on a hot day. And nobody complained. And uh, one of the things we discovered is that uh, Californians are typical people. They want their comfort most of the time. But if it's a really hot day, that 1% of real time, one, one, two, two or three days a month when it's really hot, that their sense of social belonging makes it perfectly happy to get a little warm and take your jacket off. So uh, with this came the idea of smart meters, which read the, your, your electricity usage every hour instead of every month. And, uh, transmit that back to the power, to the utility. And then uh, how does one get, hmm? Um, and then how does one get people to respond to that price? Well, to that, to the shortage? Well, of course, you do it with price. Uh, so now we talked about advanced meters and uh, time-dependent tariffs and uh, uh, something. And I, th I propose that a thermostat is the easiest thing to use. Um, this is the sort of pricing which is now sweeping into California now that we've invested in 12 million smart meters. The average price of California, this is a typical week in, say, August. The average price today is about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, this critical peak pricing with time of use is what will be offered to you in 2013. In fact, uh, if the present set of PUC commissioners doesn't get replaced this fall, uh, this is uh, already part of the PG&E rate case. Um, you'll get cheap electricity off-peak. The price will double on-peak uh, every weekday, not holiday afternoon. And then critical peak pricing will be announced uh, 24 hours ahead of time, uh, typically at the second or third day of a heat wave, hopefully not the third, fourth, and fifth days of heat waves. Um, and then uh, real emergencies once every 10 years and so on, uh, the price might go even higher. And that won't give you advance warning, uh, or not much advance warning if a car runs into a transmission pole or a utility pole or a forest fire breaks out. Um, the The bill pricing rate will be designed so that it's revenue neutral in the following sense. If you don't respond, you ought to get the same bill on the average as you got with the once a month rate. Uh, and all the tiers can be attached to the once a month rate. Um, if you respond, you'll save money. But you don't have to respond. You can always buy through, and you just have your old rate. Um, and the last slide shows you uh, how popular this was with a $10 million pilot program. Uh, the blue is the answer of people. Uh, would they recommend uh, all customers being moved on to this rate? Did they like it that much? And the answer was uh, 2 thirds or 3 quarters 
said yes, they thought it should be done. And uh, uh, the other said probably it should be done. Uh, I, I think nobody said it shouldn't be done. The savings were quite amazing. Uh, this is a three-ton air conditioner drawing about three kilowatts. Um, the red line, the, so that's the base case, um, the control case. The red line was what happened when people set up their thermostats four or five degrees. And of course, many of these people weren't, weren't home. They just had to program setting up their thermostats. This requires a communicating thermostat. That's the last picture I'll show you in a minute. The most interesting thing was the group in the middle who were told that there was a shortage of electricity and their thermostat had an indicator on it that there was a shortage of electricity, but they weren't charged for the shortage. And as good citizens on a really hot day, they set up their thermostats, which we thought was quite amazing. Um, this is 20 or 30 commercial buildings, which uh, have been pre-programmed to just respond automatically to critical peak days. Uh, this work came from LBL. It's called Automated Demand Response. Uh, it's, in, it's web connected, and it seems to work very nicely, and gets a 10% savings reliably on a hot day. Uh, this is a smart thermostat with made by a, a regular thermostat maker available at uh, Ron, who sells it? Home Depot. Home Depot. And uh, at the back, you see something interesting. Um, it uh, is built communications ready, and then when you buy your house and hook your new house and hook up to your utility, you get a free from your utility extension port with this little USNAP chip, uh, which slides in and connects you to your utility. And then if you have a home area network, which is Wi-Fi or Zigbee or whatever, uh, you get that. It'll probably cost you $10 from Radio Shack. And uh, you're connected up to your home area network. Uh, your, your thermostat is the brains of it, but this will connect you up to your uh, controls for your pool pump and your washing machine and so forth and so on. So uh, that's all coming along nicely. And uh, thank you for letting me run over. And thank you very much.